also um, prevalent in Mexico. And um, although they don't pose uh, a lot of problems for us, we definitely are tracking them. Um, and there is a lot of violence associated with them. When you look at things like the, uh, the Oklahoma City bombing, which is one of the photos on this slide, there are individuals who, um, for whatever reason, uh, want to make a big impression. Um, and the technology to do that is not all that great. Uh, you can get it all on the internet. When you look at weapon smuggling and just all the drugs that come through, uh, those are very key, uh, key challenges that we're working with. One of the other issues that we're uh, focused on is uh, hazardous materials. There's um, plenty of hazardous materials that get transported across New Mexico, either through the state or, uh, or coming to the state. Uh, any of these uh, railroad cars or semi-trailers, a big accident at the wrong place could be a pretty significant issue. Um, the lower photo, to me, speaks to pandemics. Uh, we just had a, an exercise in the state uh, dealing with the pandemic, and uh, the Department of Health did a very good job of uh, organizing and dealing with that, and actually got a, a very high score from their uh, assessors. Uh, so that's one of those key areas in New Mexico that I think things are going very well. They, they seem to have a very good program. We work very closely with them, and uh, that all seems to be working pretty good. I love this photo. Um, and this is actually a very common, uh, common event now. The climate change that has occurred and the heat waves uh, that we're dealing with um, actually caused the tracks to buckle. And when the temperatures get over a certain range for a certain period of time, the uh, train operators actually have to slow down their, their trains so that they're actually watching for this to occur. And one thing about the climate change is uh, the heat waves, they're actually projecting that they will, they will happen a lot more frequently now than uh, they have in the past. You know, whatever the cause, uh, whether it's human-made, whether it's just a natural cycle, it doesn't really matter. The reality is we are in a new environment now than we, than we have been. Over the past 50 years, the average U.S. temperature has increased about 2 degrees. And by the end of the century, they're anticipating it's projected to increase another two and a half to eleven degrees. And um, I don't, I didn't research all the statistics, but I've heard, you know, for every degree uh, that it's raised, the sea level, you know, rises. So certainly, our coastal areas are going to be greatly affected by that if this trend continues. So these projected changes in our long-term climate, they're expected to precipitate more frequently extreme events uh, that deal with heat waves, the downpours, uh, we'll also get into infectious diseases, uh, drought and flooding, and it'll be affecting uh, the entire United States and indeed the world. Over the past several decades, the data suggests that our hurricanes have actually increased in intensity where they used to be Category 2s and 3s, we've had a lot more Category 4 and 5s. <coughs> I think if you, if you look at Mexico, uh, the fire season is one of those that you can kind of track. I mean, we actually had about 50% fewer fires in New Mexico this year than we did last year. And there was about twice as much land that actually burned last year. But this year we had the largest fire in New Mexico State history, and we also had the most damaging. So statistics don't always tell you the whole story, but it really gets back to uh, where is the fire and what kind of an impact does it have. Another thing that um, across, you know, we 
start getting into the heat uh, related issues and the rise in temperature. We are getting into a period with an aging population and the baby boomers, which I am one of, you know, over the next 20 years, the population is just going to get older. And that is one of the key uh, things that actually uh, causes the most problem with our elderly. As, we, uh, as the heat goes up, we lose electricity, they are vulnerable and at risk. So 2011 uh, was a record year. And I think this year has been a little more tame, uh, but there were 99 major disaster declarations uh, in 2011. I want to say New Mexico had uh, three or four. Uh, this year we've had four so far. That, those 99 shattered the previous record, which was the year before, that was 81. Uh, it follows a decade in the 2000s where the most presidential declarations uh, since they started tracking them in 1953, averaging about 60 a year. Eight of the last 10 years have exceeded the previous year's number of major declarations. Six of the last 10 years have surpassed the previous year's number of emergency declarations. And, that's, and 2011 also marked the largest number of fire management assistance declarations at 114. And I think uh, nationally that number is also down, but there have been some pretty incredible uh, fires that have occurred across the state, uh, across the, uh, the nation. This was an interesting slide for me, and I, I can't tell you that you are really there. But uh, to me, this represents all of the technology uh, that we have come to rely on so closely. All of our iPhones, our iPads, the wireless uh, capability, our ability to communicate with anybody, anywhere, anytime. And of course, in New Mexico, that doesn't always hold true. I've been in a lot of places in New Mexico. I haven't been able to talk to anybody. And I plan on going back soon. Uh, but we are truly a society that uh, relies on uh, the GPS satellites and communication uh, for just about everything. And it's even getting to the point where uh, in the major cities, the buildings and, and all of the infrastructure relies on electricity, communications, computers to make sure they run efficiently and effectively. If we lost that, and we can lose that in a number of ways. Uh, you can have a cyber attack, uh, which is fairly plausible and really not all that difficult uh, to do. There are a lot of uh, kids out there who are experimenting, who have done a lot of damage, and there's a lot of professionals out there who, uh, for whatever purpose, uh, could cause some serious havoc as well. And so when you start talking about the gas lines or the electrical grid or dams and levees, those are all controlled uh, essentially through the internet. And this is uh, one of those things you don't really think about that often, but uh, we are truly in a period where uh, the solar storm activity is supposed to be peaking here in the next two years. <coughs> And one good solar storm uh, that is focused at, at Earth could actually fry a grid. And the good news about that is uh, when you get to see a really cool aurora borealis uh, in most of the country. But the other thing is it actually takes some time for that blast of energy to hit the Earth. So it is also one of those daily briefs that I get where they show the sunspot activity and it allows us a little bit of time to prepare. So it's not something we generally think about that often, and I don't think every industry, uh, be it electric or gas, or just the, the bigger businesses really focus on this, that I may have to shut things down for a period of uh, a day or two just to let this thing pass so that everything doesn't fry. Uh, the electrical grid is probably the most susceptible, although certainly would affect many satellites as well, which could affect all the GPS, all the logistics, all the shipping. Uh, but when this
this thing blows a transformer due to our globalization, um, we don't we don't build transformers in the United States. It's all done overseas, and it's not a mass production capability that that exists. So it would take a very long time to build that capability back up again. photos. Um, there's nothing like having an incident and all the news is going out. We need you to evacuate. We need you to get out. And then you have some yahoos that think, hey, this is great. I just love being next to a hurricane. And I still don't really understand that mentality, but uh, that's what you get with uh, down here. You people who Maybe have been told many, many times, hey, the hurricane's coming, we need you to get out, and it doesn't, doesn't affect them. So they get tired or complacent or whatever, and they stick it out, and then all of a sudden, we're having to send crews out for search and rescue. Not a very good, very good scene. Um, the uh, picture on the, the lower right is uh, of a shelter. Any of you have actually visited a shelter or been in a shelter, but they're not a very nice place to be. It's a place you want to maybe go in, get a meal, maybe get some rest, but you don't want to be there for days. The economy is another one of those issues that uh, affect our ability to respond to disasters. And, you know, it's no secret the economy is in a bit of a slump. A lot of businesses have gone, gone under, uh, a lot of unemployment, uh, and that definitely greatly affects a community's ability to respond. And I have no idea what year that center one came from, but I liked it. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody recognizes this. It's a little, a little more blurry on the, the big screen than it is on my computer, but Fukushima was Japan's worst nightmare. Uh, when you have the number of events that they had to deal with, you know, starting with the earthquake and then the tsunami and then the nuclear disaster that they had, that is a significant thing to deal with. And uh, I was watching some video of the, uh, I think he's the prime minister, the, their leader, and he was not dealing with it well. It took them a long time to actually get on track to, to deal with this level of disaster. And what I tend to do is think, well, what, what is the Fukushima for New Mexico? What is, and I think the question was raised earlier, what, what is it that we're thinking about? And you really can't predict it. I mean, if we could predict what our worst case is and be all ready and prepared for it, uh, that'd be great. Uh, but we just don't know what sequence of events are going to happen that will lead to something that we really didn't anticipate. So I picked out some charts. Again, uh, shamelessly stole these from uh, another organization. Uh, again, I, as I've already mentioned, I think this is actually a fairly good news story. We spend a lot more in health but I believe our preparedness in the health arena and our level of health care compared to others is actually very good. I don't know that I would really want to see those numbers change. Education uh, is a little bit of a different story. We, uh, we tend not to do so well there. The one thing that I really don't like about the slide, and you may not be able to see it, but you know, China's listed as first, but it's only Shanghai. It's not the entire country. And I think if you viewed China as a whole instead of their, their core city, uh, those numbers would change dramatically for them as well. But that doesn't diminish the point that um, we really with all the money that we spend on education, federal and state and local, um, we, I, 
believe we're failing, uh, failing our kids. And when you talk about infrastructure, uh, again, uh, federally we spend less on infrastructure than most other developed countries. And we've been spending about 3% for the last 10 years or so, or the last 20 years. But it's not enough. Uh, we have, uh, I think, about 600,000 bridges in the United States, and about 35% of them are at risk of being inoperable. And then you get into the roads and, and all the other uh, major infrastructure, even our power grid is uh, at risk. So I think this is an area, and again, you can see the grades on top, but an area where even without a disaster, uh, our infrastructure is not in a sustainable uh, state right now. So when you look at us uh, from a global uh, competitive standpoint, uh, we also don't compete very well there, and you can see the major factors that they list, but globalization uh, is one of those uh, new realities as well. Um, we rely on um, multinational corporations, we rely on imports, uh, we rely on our exports, we're, so, we're not self-dependent anymore. But when you look at all these factors put together and all the slides that I've kind of talked about, you can see that we're not in a position where we can say, uh, I think the United States has a sustainable and prepared uh, society. And of course, our budget uh, is another major factor. Um, between our uh, Social Security and Medicare and then the interest on the debt alone, we're getting to the point where we are unable to fund uh, key programs. All of the uh, federal programs uh, involved with Homeland Security and emergency management are at risk. And I think that's a very significant problem. What, what would the state do, uh, what would New Mexico do, if the feds finally said, well, we're gonna balance the budget. One of the things we're gonna do is cut uh, the federal funding for emergency management Homeland Security. Well, I can tell you that 95% of the funding that I work with comes from the feds. Uh, so we would cease to exist. Uh, a lot of the money that we get, we pass through to the counties. Um, so it would be a significant issue. And I believe the state would be able to re kind of recover uh, near what it needs to to have a, a decent program. Here's another wonderful uh, picture of our fiscal crisis. Uh, we keep spending more than we bring in. Our uh, debt to GDP keeps going up. And it's, it's unsustainable. If you think about what is a sustainable society, uh, this is not the picture that you want to show. So this is the trend slide. Here's uh, the United States is trending down, China's trending up. Um, and I think it's a challenge. I think, uh, and of course, the economy, which drives a lot of the, uh, the tax revenue for the federal government, and if the economy turns around, uh, things get back on track, uh, we eventually could be in good shape. But uh, for the time being, uh, it really is a challenge. So all of that good news was really <laughs> designed to just... Uh, give you a perspective of what I think about. Uh, of course, I think about New Mexico, but there are so many factors that interplay with each other. And of course, um, part, of the, part of our challenge is you know, working with our, our county counterparts, all the law enforcement, all the federal agencies that are in the state as well. Um, and here's the, uh, the, just a general planning cycle. So we have bureaus within the state that deal with each one of those areas. And one additional with preparedness is actually protection. So we have a fusion center that we operate as well that looks at uh, a little bit of intel, uh, works with all the federal partners in terms of uh, the terrorist threat or other threats, uh, human-made threats that uh, 
could potentially come in. So we're in the preparedness mode. And I, you know, how many people here know that this month is National Preparedness Month? Well, I could get emergency manager. Sure. So, uh, you know, and I think that really kind of gets um, gets to the crux of it. I want to read you a couple more uh, statistics. That, again, these are national statistics, but I think it's fairly significant. You'll be so happy I didn't read all of these. So 71% of uh, uh, the group that was surveyed were unsure that they had a personal alerting and notification system in their area. 28% didn't know whether their community had a warning siren or not. 47% would take action based on a potential severe weather warning, which means 53% would not. 33% would require actual property damage or injury in order to care strongly about public safety awareness. 28% would require confirmation of a severe weather event, such as an actual tornado sighting or flooding or visible fire in order to take immediate action. And 8% said that nothing would cause them to care at <laughs> so, you know, here we are in an environment where we've had, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I, I remember hearing news stories, you know, of a hundred year event. You know, this is a big event, it was a hundred year. Now they're talking about thousand year events. And they're, it's not just a single event, there are multiple, and it's a, it's a pattern. So we are definitely in a period where we need to be prepared. We have to be involved and engaged in, in thinking about it. What I think um, bothers me the most is, you know, here's here's government, one little sliver. You know, this is this is the community in the center, and there are all the things uh, that feed into that. And I think if we put as much emphasis on all those other things, which is all of you, then government could actually do a much better <laughs> job. But what we've gotten ourselves into, and there's probably a lot of a lot of factors involved. You know, Katrina was a significant emotional event for pretty much the entire country. But you know what I what I tend to hear is when is FEMA going to be here? You know, they're going to fix everything. Well, that's not the right answer. The right answer is, if you as a community are prepared and stick together and pool your resources, you'll survive much better, much quicker than waiting for a FEMA to come in. They, they're good and there are a lot of resources, but it's, when you talk about that resilience and returning to a new normal, the FEMA new normal isn't necessarily that it's better, it's, it's good, it's what we used to have. There, in my view, it tends to be a little bit lower. And we're going to just settle for what we can get out of this. So the whole point of this briefing for me was to stress to you how important your involvement is. Yes, we have a State Department here that is focused solely on emergency management, threats, and hazards. Yes, there's a federal system in place that does a very good job for government. Uh, and the state's the same way. We have a lot of issues ourselves. I'm trying to, to work through some of those, and we're trying to do the best we can, but we are limited. We have a very limited staff, and most of what we have is one deep. So if that person is gone on vacation, or that person is sick, or you know, getting married, having a baby, whatever, we are generally without that capability. We just don't have a massive staff available. That's why Alita and her team, and all of you, are the most uh, important part of the equation. And that's why when she said go to ready.gov, have your kit, those are the things that will allow you to respond back quickly. And if you have that core team of folks available, you know, when you think about those communities that are just 
wiped out by a tornado. They're just leveled, or the, the hurricane comes in and wipes them out. And they're basically starting from scratch. That's when you need to have that core group of people who can think about, well, what do we want to be? How can we make ourselves better than we were? How can we build so that we don't build the same weaknesses into our infrastructure and we can withstand future events as they come? And that's not something that the government can do for you. That is a community effort. So I think, uh, I think I'll pretty much stop there. There's a, there's a whole lot that a lot of data, in, but it, it was all just depressing, so I, I skipped out on a lot of that, but hopefully that gave you a sense of some of the challenges um, that we're all thinking about and we're trying to get prepared for, but we can only do so much, we being government, and I'm speaking for state and federal. It really is, I mean, you'll hear the, uh, the comment that Disasters will always start and, and, and end locally. And that is very true. I mean, government will come in and assist, but in the long run, it's really the community uh, that recovers and moves on. And the government will, will eventually go back to where they came from. So hopefully, they gave you at least a desire to maybe go to ready.gov uh, check and see what you can do. Maybe start your own little community, uh, whether it's your neighbors um, or whoever, and get together and start getting ready for that event that may or may not come your way. But if it does and you're ready, uh, it'll pay off in, in a huge way. Thank you, Greg.